Microphone's on? Oh, yes, it is. Okay. All right. Good morning. First Baptist Church of Interlaken, New York. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for your kindness and your goodness, your faithfulness. Father God, we thank you for your mercy, Lord, that we absolutely do not deserve. Lord, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus on the cross. We thank you that you loved us first. We thank you that you drew us to yourself. We thank you for the blood of your son that washes away our sins. We thank you so much for the Holy Ghost that you've given us. We thank you that you've seated us in in heavenly places with you. Father God, we pray that you will uh, bless this morning's uh, teaching and all throughout the service, all the way to the end today as well, whoever will be speaking uh, throughout today's service as well. And um, Lord, we uh, pray that you'll help us to receive all the information that is good, help us to sort through it, and help us to be like the Bereans and uh, double check what we hear from whoever, and uh, to make sure that those things are so. So we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. The Library of the Holy Scripture, why we believe. So I think this is the absolute best reason. There's a bunch of other reasons why we believe and why we should believe, all that sort of thing. But I think we're this in my opinion, is probably one of the absolute best reasons why we believe why, and why we should believe. And the answer that we, the simple answer that we can give to the world when they ask us why it is that we should believe the Library of the Holy Scriptures. Okay, next slide, please. All right, why these 66 books? Now, this presentation is based on an article written by Nathan Businitz. Okay, um, he is the executive vice president at the Dean of Faculty at the Master's Seminary. I believe that's for um, John MacArthur, John MacArthur's uh, seminary. Next slide, please. All right, 66 books. How can we be sure that our holy library, comprised of the 66 books and no others, is the inspired Word of God? Next slide. All right, many people deny that the 66 books are the complete canon of Scripture. The Roman Catholic Church believes the apocryphal books should be included. Uh, The Mormons, if they had their way, they would add the the Book of Mormon and the doctrines of covenants and covenants and the pearl of great price, all by false false, uh, preachers, false, uh, false prophets. And then, of course, the movie The Da Vinci Code says that Constantine determined what books will be included in the Holy Bible. Next slide. All right, there are many reliable sources for us to dig deeper regarding the reliability of the canonicity of the 66 books in our Holy Bibles, God's complete and inspired word. Strongly consider using books, articles, and YouTube videos by R.C. Sproul and or the Master's Seminary and or Answers in Genesis, and certainly there's other great sources, but uh, these are great, reliable sources, in my opinion. Next slide, please. All right, we believe in the 66 books of the Bible, and here's the primary reason. I think this is the absolute best answer you can give, is because the Lord Jesus Christ affirmed the Old Testament, and because the Lord Jesus Christ authorized his apostles to write the New Testament. Next slide. All right, definition of affirm. To state as fact or to assert strongly and publicly. Jesus quoted the Old Testament as fact, and he asserted it publicly with strength and authority. All right, one thing I was thinking too was he also mentioned various characters throughout the Old Testament, true and living people, um, and he quoted them or stated their names and referred to them, again, as fact and asserted their names as public with strength and authority. And I'm referring mostly to the authors, authors of the uh, 39 books of the Old Testament. Next slide, please. All right, definition of authorize is to give official permission for or approval to. Jesus gave official permission and his approval to his apostles to oversee and write the New Testament. Think there's any better reason why we should believe it. Next slide, please. 
All right, to believe in Jesus and his authority means to believe in and submit to his word. Jesus affirmed the Old Testament, therefore we affirm the Old Testament with him. Jesus authorized his apostles to write and to oversee the writing of the New Testament, therefore we cling to it. Next slide. All right, canon. When we see the word canon, here's, here's a quick definition of what the canon means, and of course we have the ruler there, you'll see why. A biblical canon also called canon of scripture, is a set of texts which a particular Jewish or Christian religious community regards as authoritative scripture. The English word comes from the Greek. I'm going to take a wild guess and say canon, all right, because I think R.C. Sproul said that, all right, and meaning rule or measuring stick. So canon basically is rule or measuring stick. Next slide, please. All right, Jesus... Jesus, the master carpenter, determines what ruler slash measuring stick he approves of and the only one we must use, and it comes in the length of 66 books. Next slide, please. All right, Jesus affirmed the Old Testament in its entirety. Here's just one example. This is not an exhaust. These are not exhaust. Uh, this this t teaching is not exhaustive. I mean, there's many examples. Here's just some of the examples. So Jesus affirmed the Old Testament in its entirety through Matthew 5, 17 through 18. Christ came to fulfill the law. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And we know that uh, he had fulfilled a lot of it through his ministry, and ultimately with his coming back, he's going to fulfill the rest of it. So, uh, next slide, please. All right, historical reliability. Here's Jesus, um, again, quoting things from the Old Testament. Matthew 10, 15 says, Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. That's the town that actually uh, that Jesus sent his disciples to or the towns that Jesus sent his disciples to and for some reason they decide to uh, reject the message that Jesus sent them out. But the point here is that Jesus is referring to Sodom and Gomorrah as actual real cities. He doesn't think like a lot of the world thinks. They're just like uh, just metaphors of some place or something like that. Jesus actually believed believes that Sodom and Gomorrah actually existed and uh, all the stories about Sodom and Gomorrah. We know that Sodom and Gomorrah was ultimately destroyed. Lot, his wife, and two daughters got out just in time with the help of the angels. Um, and, of course, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. And uh, we know about some of the horrible things that they've done. But yet Jesus here is saying that, uh, that people who reject the message in his time are going to be uh, in more trouble than the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. But again, historical reliability, Jesus believes Sodom and Gomorrah existed, and so should we. And there's plenty of evidence to suggest that as well, archaeological, etc. Next slide, please. All right, historical reliability, same Matthew chapter 9, verse 3 through 5. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? Again, here is Jesus believing Genesis 2.24, referring to Genesis 2.24. Uh, he created them from the beginning, made them male and female, believes that Adam and Eve actually existed, not just some, uh, some mythical creatures or mythical characters that someone made up. Uh, Jesus believes that Adam and Eve existed. Jesus believes that, uh, um, that a man shall leave his father and mother and cling unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There's Jesus quoting Genesis and believing Genesis as an actual real history. Next slide, please. All right, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. <clears throat> For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The context here is uh, that's when the, some of the Jews uh, demanded a sign or requested a sign, and Jesus told them that the adulterous generation will not receive a sign. The only sign that they'll receive 
is the sign of Jonah. Uh, Jesus believed that Jonah was actually swallowed by a whale, even though many people today will try to tell you that that's not the case. But uh, Jesus believes it, and uh, so do we. Next slide, please. All right. For as in those days, excuse me, Matthew 24, verses 38 through 39, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus believed in an actual flood. Jesus believed that Noah existed. Jesus believed that there was an actual ark, that uh, Noah and his family got onto it. All right? And unfortunately, some people in this time will actually choose to even willingly be ignorant of the flood and the story of Noah and, of course, the stories of, of the Old Testament. But here again, the, the point here is Jesus believed an actual flood. Jesus believed that the people were surprised when that uh, door closed and that rain started and geysers shot up from the earth and every single person except for eight people was, was destroyed by the flood. So, again, Jesus believes Genesis as actual history. Next slide, please. All right, Jesus affirmed the Old Testament in its prophetic accuracy. All right, not only did Jesus believe that the Old Testament scriptures are historically reliable, Jesus believes that they're prophetically reliable. Matthew 26, verse 54, but how then should the scriptures be fulfilled? Then it must be so. All right, there in that, and right down there in the bottom, it says, Jesus is telling Peter to put his sword away and that he could ask his father for 12 legions of angels for assistance, but was aware and affirming the Old Testament prophecies of his sufferings in which were about to take place. He was aware of, um, yeah, what was about to take place. He's aware of what uh, Isaiah 52 and 53 say about how he's going to be bruised for our transgressions and beaten, uh, that the punishment for our iniquity is, put, is placed on him. The punishment for our shalom is, is uh, put on Jesus. Um, and, of course, we, I think we read in Psalm 22 that uh, he was, he'll be pierced through. And then, of course, we see in what Zechariah that uh, the, those who have pierced him will see him. So again, Jesus was aware of what was coming and uh, did not interfere with the, uh, with the, with the prophecies of the Old Testament. So uh, next slide, please. All right, Jesus affirmed the Old Testament insufficiency. Here's Luke 16, 31. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the time with um, Lazarus and the rich man. And Lazarus and the rich man both died, and the uh, rich man went to, went to hell. And uh, there he was requesting that Father Abraham would send Lazarus to dip his finger into a cup of water and touch it to his tongue, but Abraham had to tell him, that's not the case, that cannot happen. And then, of course, the rich man begged that Father Abraham would send Lazarus back from the dead, and uh, tell his brothers especially about that horrible place that he was going through. And uh, Jesus uh, affirms the Old Testament in its efficiency that, uh, that if those five brothers of yours are unwilling to hear the Old Testament, if they're unwilling to hear Moses and the prophets, then they will not be convinced that if someone comes back from the dead. They will not be convinced that someone comes back to the dead. So again, um, Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament is sufficient. A lot of times in these days, I know we get kind of desperate and uh, we're hoping that may, maybe if we just do church this way or maybe if we do church that way or maybe if we just say something different or put a different spin on it, that just maybe people will believe it differently. But again, um, if Jesus was convinced that Moses and the prophets or the 39 books of the Old Testament was enough um, to get people into the kingdom, then uh, we should too. That, amen. amen. All right, next slide, please. All right, Jesus affirmed the Old Testament in his unity. Luke 24, verse 27, and beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And Luke 24, 44, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you 
that everything written about me in, law, in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And this, this is after Jesus' resurrection. This is uh, on the road to Emaus, I believe. Emaus, Emaus. And uh, the two guys or whatever, they were a little upset about what had just happened. They had kind of lost all hope. Here comes this stranger. They're not realizing it's Jesus himself. And uh, starts, to, uh, starts to teach these two folks, these two guys, about uh, um, how Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms all uh, spoke about him. And then, of course, it took them inviting him in to eat dinner, and then he broke the bread, lifted it up, gave thanks, and then disappeared. And then they, they realized that it was Jesus himself. So again, the unity uh, throughout the Old Testament, that uh, it does not contradict itself. It does not contradict itself. It's one story, and uh, ultimately it's about the same person, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus believed Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, especially uh, those areas that referred to him, and uh, those, are the, those, are the, those, those are the things that he made clear to his, to his disciples, and I think we should do the same thing. We should become familiar with Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, and how they refer to Jesus, and how they must be fulfilled, and how they have been fulfilled, and must be fulfilled, and how they ultimately will be fulfilled, um, to, uh, to convince people about uh, who Jesus is. So... Jesus affirmed the Old Testament in its unity. Next slide, please. All right, Jesus affirmed the Old Testament in its inerrancy. Inerrancy, without error. Okay, Matthew 22, verse 29. But Jesus answered them, you are wrong, because you neither know, because you not, you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. Here's a group of Sadducees. They come up to Jesus, and they testing him. They didn't really believe in the resurrection. Um, so they said to him, uh, they thought they would throw him off, and they said, hey, a woman got married, and uh, her husband died. And then, uh, of course, according to Old Testament or Jewish tradition or Jewish uh, instructions, the, the brother should then marry the, his, his brother's wife and then have a child with her, and then the very first child would, uh, would be called the brothers, but in this case, they just kind of kept going and saying the, bro the, the husband kept dying, so about seven different brothers later, um, and then they finally questioned Jesus, and they said, so when, when she, and he, she dies and those seven men die, whose husband will she be in heaven? So that's another, that's another big one, just to go off there, is a lot of people today believe that that husband and wife are going to be a husband and wife in heaven. So we can kindly and gently help, uh, correct them and teach them that that's not the case. But in this case, um, Jesus is instructing them uh, that, I, I love it, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Now this could have been even in, in, in a nice tone. Because you don't know the scriptures, you're wrong. You're wrong. And where we don't know the scriptures... We're wrong. We're wrong. So uh, Jesus is saying, unless you know the scriptures, and if you're ever coming in conflict with them at all whatsoever, praise God for his grace, because anyways, but uh, you are wrong. We are wrong. If we don't know the scriptures, we are wrong, period. All right, here's John 17, 17, English Standard Version. Jesus is praying for his disciples and all of those who will believe in him through the disciples, through the apostles. He says, sanctify them in your truth. And then what is truth? Your word is truth. Your word is truth. So if we want to know what truth is today, God's word is truth. All right, next slide, please. All right, Jesus affirmed the Old Testament in its infallibility. All right. John 10, 35, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, that's Psalm 82, verse 6. This is when uh, they wanted to stone him because he said he was the son of God. But yet, in the Old Testament, their scriptures, people were referred to as gods. Judges were referred to as gods. Um, like, like uh, how do I explain it? But like, like little, little gods. They were, they, were, they were given the oracles of the scripture. They were, they were uh, trusted with, with God's word. And they were trusted to present that to the people, and they referred to as God. So Jesus is saying, wait a minute, if I'm saying I'm the son of God, why do you guys have any problem with that? And on top of that, look at the things that I'm doing. And if you don't want to believe me, at least believe the works that I'm doing. 
that I and the Father are one. And then, of course, they wanted to stone him again after that, so they, they didn't want to see it. But there's Jesus infe- uh, affirming the infallibility of the Old Testament scripture. Okay, next slide, please. All right, Jesus affirmed the Old Testament and its authority. All right, Matthew 21, verse 13. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Isaiah 56, verse 7, and Jeremiah 7, 11, in combination. And uh, there is Jesus saying, God's word is final. God's word has the authority, especially in reference to his house, especially in reference to the temple. And uh, these people are just doing whatever they feel like it and thinking that it's completely okay. But again, uh, Jesus is saying God's word gets the last word, and uh, no one has the right to, to override that. Next slide, please. Okay, authority. Matthew 21, 16, English Standard Version. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise? And there's little kids, little kids were in the temple saying Hosanna to the son of David in reference to Jesus Christ. I mean, that's, that's amazing. And these people, they had an issue with it. They thought, uh, they thought that Jesus should, like, rebuke them. Hey, calm down, kids. That's not the case. But uh, that was the case. The son of David, the, uh, the Messiah. So, uh, again, it's authority. If God says that it's going to happen, and when it does happen, we should take, we should take note. Next slide, please. Okay, here's another one. Matthew 21, verse 42. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Psalm 118, verse 22, verse 23, that's what he was referencing. And uh, what's interesting here is that, that God somehow organized it um, because he could do that, but or, organized it so that the people would actually reject Jesus the Messiah so that all those things would be fulfilled. And we, we go back into the Old Testament. Remember when, uh, when Jesus, or God, well, Jesus, but God uh, hardened the heart of Pharaoh and things actually came around. And the reason he had hardened their hearts so that he can show himself to be amazing and awesome like he did. And here we got uh, that people should be able to see it so clearly with their own eyes, but for some reason, by the hardness of their hearts, they harden their hearts first, and perhaps God hardened their hearts later, and uh, ultimately, they end up rejecting the cornerstone, and uh, that was, uh, ultimately, it was the Lord's doing. All right, next slide, please. All right, Je- Jesus clearly viewed the entire Old Testament as the Word of God, Mark seven thirteen thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And in this case was when uh, they said they were trying to, with the honor in your father and your mother, and they said something about any gift that I've given to God is like Corbin, and uh, is as if I've given it to you anyways. And then here's Jesus saying then by outdoing uh, the, the actual commandment of God, the actual word of God. You guys just come, come up with your own stuff and just uh, shoot from the hip and uh, sounds good and this is, this is what you end up doing. But uh, you're wrong and God's word is right. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. All right, so I threw the, the apocryphal books in here. Here's this, again, this whole, this whole teaching is about why we believe the Old Testament, why we believe the 39 books, why we believe that the apocryphal books were uh, not are not the actual word of God, and uh, and then so, but this this doesn't really go along with the point, except for the apocryphal books. It says right here the early church fathers considered the apocryphal books helpful, but not authoritative. And then of course the f- fifth century scholar Jerome, who translated the Latin Vulgate, which became the standard Roman Catholic version of the Middle Ages. This person even recognized, according to uh, Nathan, that the apocryphal books were not authoritative. Neither were they canonical. All right, next slide, please. All right, now we go into the New Testament, our New Testament canon. And uh, the New Testament canon is the additional revelation to the church that was promised by Jesus through the ministry, authority, and writings of his apostles. So we'll see those verses coming up, um, what, what that means. So Jesus promised 
the New Testament to us, to the, to the first century church, to his apostles, to his disciples, and said, it's going to happen through you guys. That's why we can, then we can trust it. All right, next uh, slide, please. All right, remember, there's verses essential for the doctrine of canonicity, especially what's um, underlined down there. John 14, verse 25 through 26, here's Jesus. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Jesus promised it was going to happen. Jesus has proven himself reliable over and over. If he says that they're going to be able, that the Holy Spirit is going to come and help them to remember everything that he has said, it's going to happen. And we believe it because Jesus said it and because Jesus made that promise and because Jesus is faithful and he never lies. All right, next slide, please. All right, additional revelation promised by Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Again, we're referring to the New Testament or New Testament epistles. John 16, verses 12 through 15 Here's uh, Jesus again. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. All right? They're still in a position probably where they can only accept milk. All right? When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus again promising all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All right, next slide, please. All right, the New Testament was pre-authenticated by Christ himself, authorizing the apostles to be his witnesses in the world. These are instructions for us as well, but first and foremost, primarily for the apostles, all right? Matthew 28, 18 through 19, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter one, verse eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That one's pretty awesome. I mean, they're both awesome. But Acts 1.8, here's, here's Jesus. We can believe that Jesus gave his disciples, his, his apostles, the power and the authority that whatever came out of their mouth from this point forward, whatever was, whatever was written down, especially what was written, is legit. Jesus authorized it. All right, next uh, slide, please. Thank you. Jesus authorized New Testament writers, a.k.a. apostles. They were in... Oh, yes, that's what I said. Jesus' authorized New Testament writers, a.k.a. the apostles. All right. We're inspired the same way as the writers of the Old Testament were. Look at 2 Peter 1, 19-21. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. All right, next slide, please. All right, official canon criteria, first and foremost, must be written by Jesus' authorized officials, his direct apostles, or directly under the oversight of their ministry. All right, Jesus, that's Jesus right there, giving the stamp of approval. All right, uh, next slide, please. All right, check. Gospels according to Matthew and John. Do they meet the criteria? Let's see. There are two New Testament books written by two of Jesus Christ's authorized representatives, a.k.a. two of his official firsthand apostles. Check, i.e., official criteria for canon met. Next slide, please. All right, the Gospel according to Mark is a record of the memoirs of the Apostle Peter, written by Mark, under Peter's apostolic authority. Check. Next slide, please. All right, the Gospel according to Luke and the book of Acts are products of careful investigation and eyewitness testimony. Here's Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Inasmuch as many have undertaken the, to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, 
just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely to some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Next slide. All right. That's Luke the doctor writing his books. All right. The book of Acts, Luke part 2, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he, has ta- when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Next slide. All right, the gospel according to Luke in the book of Acts. Careful investigations that would have used apostolic sources, and these books were written under the apostolic oversight of Paul. Next slide. All right, here's Pauline epistles, Romans through Philemon, all written by and or addressed in the greeting directly from Paul himself. Unfortunately, today, there's actually a lot of uh, even Christians who just choose, the, they call themselves uh, not, not between Philemon and Romans Christians. For some reason, they just absolutely rejected Paul altogether. Uh, it's very sad, and I think that's one of the, I, in me, my personal opinion, I believe it's one of the primary uh, problems with today's church is rejecting uh, Paul as an apostle and his, and his instructions. But anyway, so... Um, all written by and or addressed in the greeting directly from Paul himself. Next slide, please. All right, the book of Hebrews. A little coffee there in the back. All right, authorship unknown. All right, many in church history believe it to have been written by Paul or clearly written by someone closely associated with Paul's ministry, at the bare minimum under the apostolic authority of Paul. Next slide. All right, the general epistles, letters of James, Peter, and John, all written by apostles. What more needs to be said? Note, Peter acknowledged Paul's writings as scripture, 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16a. And, the, and here's, Paul, here's Peter about Paul. It says, and count the patience of our Lord and salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. So how can you say that you believe Peter? But here's Peter saying, go, Paul, Paul. And that was actually, believe it or not, I guess that second criteria for picking the, uh, the 27 books of the New Testament was first and foremost, apostolic authority. And then second, do they agree with each other? Do they agree with each other? Did they quote each other? Did they whatever each other? You know, they kind of like overlapped and, and agreed with one another. So that was the, uh, that's the second primary um, criteria for picking 27 books, but our first and foremost, the one that we care about the most, is that Jesus himself uh, authorized it. So, all right, next, uh, next slide, please. All right, book of Jude, written by the half-brother of Jesus, Matthew 13, 55, says, is not this the carpenter's son? Uh, is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, or Jude? And Mark 6, 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joses, Jose's, and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. All right. Uh, next slide. So half-brother of Jesus. Oh, and under the apostolic oversight of his brother James. All right. Jude also operated under the apostolic oversight of his brother James. Book of Jude. Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Next slide, please. All right, the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, written by the Apostle John. Next slide. All right, every book of the New Testament was written by an official, firsthand, authorized representative, Apostle of Jesus Christ, or by someone directly linked to the ministry of an official, firsthand, authorized representative slash Apostle of Jesus Christ. When we submit to the 27 books in the New Testament, we are submitting directly to Jesus himself. Next slide. Why do we believe the 66 books of the Old and New Testament? Because Jesus affirmed the Old Testament and authorized the New Testament. Period. Next slide. All right, the authority of Jesus. I probably should have just ended with that one. All right, the authority of Jesus is the... (laughs) 
is the basis for our confidence that the Holy Bible we cherish, we read, we study, and we must obey is indeed all Scripture. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. You ever get confused and think, ah, oh, but what about this? What about that? All right, when it comes to well, what should I follow? What should I listen to? What should I embrace? First and foremost, the words of Jesus Christ and the words, the written words of, of his apostles. That supersedes everything, all right? And that's just like a little badge showing the, uh, the authority of Jesus there. Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, great I am, Son of God, ruler of the universe and creator of all things. Next slide. That's it. Let's pray. All right, Father God, Lord, we love you, and we thank you so much that, uh, that you've given us your word. Lord God, we thank you so much that somehow we've been blessed enough to have your, your word written into our native tongue. Lord, that you've cared enough, cared enough of, about us, and others in the past have cared enough about us and put their lives on the line so that we can have your word in our native tongue. Well, Father God, uh, help us to read it. Help us to be in it. Help us to obey it. Help us to know, know it better, know it more. Help us to know you more and help us to make you known to the world as well. Um, yeah, Father God, always give us an answer for the hope that's in us. Help us to give that answer to the world. And we know now, Father God, the primary answer is because Jesus believed it. Jesus believed it. We can say that kindly. We can also say kindly. Now what? Jesus believed it. So, um, Help us to hold on to that first and foremost, Father God, and, uh, and run with it. In Jesus' name, amen.